Hi, I'm Barry Johnson. I'm here to talk about the technical aspects of a very simple, virally deployed solar thermal water pasteurizer that's of flow through design. It could save many lives in the tropics. I say could, it may not definitely. And the secret, one of the secrets to doing so will be to get the technical side of it just right. This aspect of it, of the, of the video series, looks at how the sun can do pasteurization, what pasteurization is, why the tropics are best. It also reviews some of the other ways that water can be made clean so that that pasteurization can be put in context. Um, and then looks at two main, two other kinds of water purifiers. Focuses then on the next step and prototyping. I hope it's useful. What is pasteurization? Well, pasteurization kills almost all pathogens, almost all disease-causing organisms by heating them to over 60 degrees for a period of time. So, for example, milk is heated to just over 70 Celsius for 15 seconds. Fruit juice is treated similarly. Most fruit juice that you drink is pasteurized. It reduces the disease that you could get from infection and extends the storage life of milk. Louis Pasteur invented it. His thermal disinfection processes can be used for water. The trick is to make sure that it's not an energy intensive process or that if you use energy, that energy is free, hence solar. So, how could a solar water pasteurizer save lives? Well, it can heat biologically contaminated water to at least 65 degrees, probably, probably to a higher temperature, using a thermally actuated, that's thermally switched on and off, flow controller, a bit like a radiator valve, and it pasteurizes water, it holds it for long enough to inactivate pathogens, disease-causing creatures, which are things like viruses such as hepatitis, bacteria such as cholera, protozoa such as amoebae, and various different worms and things. So it can save lives, and a lot of lives, potentially. And the earlier videos look at how many lives potentially it could save. Here's an example of the temperature time chart that you can see for different pathogens. You can see that um, cholera is killed at fairly low temperatures, whereas um, viruses need higher temperatures. There's a lot of work done on the temperature time charts for pathogens, but obviously some of the work for the solar water pasteurization will be to stay in the, the safe zone, which is the hatched area on the top right-hand side. But what does pasteurization not achieve? Now, if we're trying to use pasteurization to make water safe, it makes it safe by getting rid of disease-causing pathogens, disease-causing living things, but it doesn't remove toxic chemicals such as arsenic or lead, which you can get from underground water, and it doesn't re remove pesticides or the toxic chemicals that are made from blue-green bacteria algae blooms, such, such as you get in surface water. Nor does it remove particles such as mud, taste or smell. So there may be some need for pretreatment, but if we're going to try to roll this project out in the most successful way, there are so many places in the world that are short of clean water um, that it's probably going to make se sense to cherry-pick those where there aren't great needs for removals of toxins, pesticides or particulates. Why deliver solar water pasteurization in the tropics? Well, the main demand for cleaner water, the main causes of uh, the main reason places where death is killing, where, where pasteurized water is killing most people, is in the tropics. And the other good benefit is that the fact that the sun doesn't vary much in its brightness from one season to the next is really important. I'm sitting in a room in Chester in England, and here there's six times more sun in an average December than an average, sorry, in a six times less sun in an average December than an average June. That would make a solar pasteurizer work accordingly less in December, whereas in the tropics, the sun is always overhead, at least for some time of the day. Here's a map. You can see just how many places are, um, are covered by the tropics. So is there a need for a low-cost, reliable, pathogen-free, clean drinking water? Yes, there is a need. Where is it the greatest? In the tropics and that's where this technology performs the best. But of course do alternative systems exist to make water drinkable and yes there are many and the National Renewable Energy Laboratories in the States did quite some very interesting work on this. I would you know, if you want to look up on this I'd search for the NREL paper on renewable um, energy and water pasteurization. Are there alternative drinking quality development projects around? Yes there are many. Some don't use solar such as they, some use you know, batteries to make chlorine from salt solution, um, and some use solar. 
we're going to look at the solar ones now because there's not time to look at everything. But just to step back first of all, let's just look at what the NREL paper said comparing low-cost water disinfection techniques. They've all got pros, they've all got cons. Adding chlorine is simple. It's not very good against worms and protozoa. It doesn't taste good. It's got a cost and a supply challenge. What, what, what we're trying to do with the water pasteurizer project is to only have potentially some small resource constraints on actually making the technology and zero complaint constraints on actually operating it to keep the water safe. Sand filters, well they're easy to build, um, but they do mainly pumping, they may need a trained operator which can be a real problem um, and maintenance, and that maintenance changes the performance um, before and after it's been cleaned. So you have a, you know, a peaks and troughs in performance which can be a worry. Smaller level filters of sand or ceramics can work domestically, but they're not very good against viruses, and again, some need regular maintenance. Ultraviolet, lamp, ultraviolet lamps can be used at a domestic scale, but they're not good against worms and protozoa. They use power, the bulbs can fail or get scaled up. Another technique is SODIS, soda water, solar water disinfection, disinfection, which we'll look at in a moment. It's a domestic effective system. Um, it does very slow, slow volumes, however, but it is, it's solar related in performance, which is potentially a drawback for the technology that I'm proposing anyway, which is solar thermal pasteurization. It's a domestic scale, can be a bit bigger. It's effective against all pathogens. This is one of the wonderful things, and it's potentially low cost. Currently, it's fairly high cost because imported, um, superbly made systems are being made in Switzerland and uh, deployed in various countries around the world, but they're not being copied, and that's the key thing. The... Cons of this are solar-related performance, so we need to make sure that they are in places where the sun is fairly steady. Um, and there aren't, don't seem to be many other cons. There don't seem to be many other negative points about it. So why has there been a blind eye turned to solar water pasteurization? Is it because it's been forgotten? Or is it because the technology is easy to overlook? I just don't know. But it doesn't use vast amounts of energy, provided you use solar energy and you put a heat exchanger in to recover your heat. So let's compare the two main solar ones. There's batch water pasteurization. There are some thermal methods where you, you um, which, are, which I haven't put on this slide, where you put tubs surrounded by mirrors or something like that, and um, they work. And you can use waxes that melt at certain temperatures to show that the system is clean. Or you can use a soda system, which um, is a transparent bottle which you put on a roof, and the ultraviolet does most of the killing. Or there are flow-through solar water pasteurizers. Water Kiosk is a, a Swiss program which works um, wonders by deploying these, but they're not copied. Um, and the Americans did develop a technology, but again, it was too expensive. So what I'm proposing is developing one or more locally available flow-through technologies that do continuously when the sun is shining well, delivering larger volumes of cleaner water. Here's Sodis. Bottles on the roof on the top right, very simple, you've got to use the right bottles, but it does work, and it's very low cost. Here's the water kiosk, an amazing technology, and they've actually lent me a valve to try um, on, on a prototype, which uses a gravity-fed system, and it has an external heat exchanger, unlike the system that I'm proposing, which has an internal heat exchanger. Also, it uses imported components, where I'm hoping, apart from the valve, maybe even the valve, to use locally made components. Price to make in Switzerland is around $5 by my estimates, so its market share will be small and it won't get copied. What's preventing water kiosk or similar from going viral? And I'm not denigrating this technology, I think it's amazing and I know the people involved. The delivered cost of litre, or per litre of safe water, is quite high. It's expensive to make it abroad and to transport it. The logistics of transporting glass technology can be difficult. Um, importing can cause delays, administration, and I've heard even some stories that you've got to bribe officials to bring in um, a life-saving technology. The social context, is their integration with the wider hygiene and sanitation loop? Yes, they're looking at that. Um, there seems to be no state, in there's no incentive to, uh, for the state to support this system because it's not making local jobs. It's top-down, which is um, a workable model for aid, but it's not the bottom-up, which we're trying to do. Communication-wise, the design is relatively secret. I'd like to have a website, blogs, videos and manuals saying the idea of making solar pasteurizers is everybody's, let's do it, let's keep it that, keep it public. The manufacturer is currently secret of water kiosk. Again, the same openness applies. 
the installation, we'd like to explain it really, really well. Um, and the deployment channels, schools and hospitals, may not attract the most copiers. I don't know about that. Um, I hope I'm not offending water kiosk by saying this, but you know, I'm, we're doing this part-time and I'm just hoping to come up with ideas on how to improve things. So, operation. Well, is there going to be a problem with seasonality? We don't know. Could there be safety failures? Can the valve be really reliable? Is there no capability to go viral with the product? And this is the key thing. I don't think there's capability to go viral. Uh, seasonality and performance doesn't seem to be a big issue with water kiosk. And um, the water safety failures don't appear to happen. The big issue is not capable to go viral. So here we have, with water kiosk, a proven water pasteurization technology which doesn't viralize. What we're trying to do is to have a proven water pasteurization technology which does viralize. Just to complete the picture, here's a design with an external heat exchanger which summarizes the design of the NREL design and also the water kiosk one. So what are we looking at? Well, the one I'm looking at is a solar heater of maybe one to four square meters surface area. It might perform form part of a roof or a rain shelter, and it would have hydraulically an integral valve or flow controller inside it, heat exchanger, and maybe storage vessels inside or outside, which would all be made of internationally safe, certified food grade materials, which we can take not just low temperatures, but high temperatures. Maybe there's a second robust version that you could make for aid projects for disasters, which you could throw out of a helicopter or something like that, but uh, that's uh, very much pie in the sky on the wish list at this stage. The target throughput, if it were three square meters, would be the system would deliver 60 liters, enough for 20 people if they drank three liters a day on, each, on every sunny day. But the sun doesn't shine every day, so if you have that, you'd have one system giving enough water for 10 people. And you'd need to store enough water for overcast days, so you'd need to build in storage for a good week or more of water. You may need to have other water pretreatment systems as well for particulates, but the hope is that the deployment takes place in areas where the only problem with the water is biocontamination. That's the design summarised again. Have a look at it if you want. Pause the, uh, the video. So what are the next three steps? Well, if somebody said, let's get this project to run, what would we do? I would do three things. I'd do a deployment option analysis. In other words, I'd look at all the potential sites in the tropics and say, what are really suitable? You know, we need to have potential to close the, the hygiene loop where sanitation is already in place, that sort of thing. We'd need to have where people have got the incentive to stay and, and build their communities. So it, we may not take the poorest of communities. We might take one step off the poorest. I don't know yet. But there's certainly some you know, other dimensions to be added as well as just sunlight. To, to help choose those sites, as well as political dimensions of, of you know, which countries would like to have um, supposed third-party enablers coming in to teach people how to make clean water. What are the deployment challenges? Solar radiation varies in a year. There could be other ones as well. Closing the sanitation loop. I'd like to calculate how many people could actually ben benefit, and I've done that on a spreadsheet in an earlier slide. And ultimately what I want to do is to name several deployment sites across three continents. Now there's two ways to do that. One is to put all the data into a, a big sort of mapping system and say statistically, here are the best places, and then phone up and say, can we talk, can we work with you? And the other way to do it is to network with NGOs and, and developing organisations and develop a fairly large list and say, look, we'll try and choose the, the most likely places to succeed. I don't know which option we'll do. We might do a combination of both. We also need to look at valves. There are several valves around which do the job. The trick is to make sure that they're low cost and safe. Um, both There are car radiator valves, home radiator valves, and also water safety valves, all candidates which apparently provenly are proven to work. And then, of course, prototyping. The colour diagram I showed earlier is just one design. It may not work. There may be many other designs that people could do to make this system work. How would I do that? Well. Ideally, I'd like to ask several competent people, both engineers and unqualified DIY enthusiasts, to make prototypes, to keep an idea of the cost, to tell us what valves they're using, and to test them for water quality. And the idea will be to develop one or more appropriate technologies, appropriate meaning for the countries where they're going to be deployed, so they can be made locally at low cost, using common 
new or reclaimed parts. Recycling would make a, be a nice little tweak for the project if it could happen, but I wouldn't build it in necessarily. Um, it would need to be operated and maintained with no energy and minimal skills because energy input is a requirement for some of the water hygiene systems and skill is also one of the ones and we want to get rid of those. It's got to be replicated easily and safely without barriers, proven to be safe and reliable in all circumstances and performance assessed so that we can say fairly accurately with X amount of sunlight we can get Y amount of water cleaned each day. Can it be delivered? What are the chances of success? Well, currently I'm just talking in a room. I don't know what the chances are. I think the chance of getting a technology which is appropriate is very high, well over 50%. I think the chance of that being deployed virally is probably less than 50%, but I'd like to be persuaded it could be higher. But there are, have been virally deployed technologies like toilets and um, simple solar lighting systems, which have become incredibly popular incredibly quickly. So it could happen. But the technical side could become a student project or a multi-student project globally. And this is where I'd love you, if you're listening to this, to talk to other engineering and practical students to see if they'd like to take on this. Prototyping plus deployment makes is important. What would happen if we were to do this? I've drafted a project brief um, for students. You can hack this around as you like. It's got five points. Point one, make two to three different sorts of prototypes. The second point, stress test and assess their performance. Try and break them. <laughs> point three, iterate towards better designs because they've got to be robust, simple. We're not looking at high-tech stuff. If you introduce components that aren't going to be available in developing countries, you've gone off track. Stay on track, please. Then produce a self-assembly manual in a 10-minute video. You see how hard it is to compress things into 10 minutes of how to do, how to make these things. And finally, discuss and talk about how to optimise the potential for viral deployment, because there's no point in making a technology if people aren't going to enthuse about it and copy it many, many times. My target is for a doubling time every three months. Can that happen? I don't know. Local sourcing and manufacture would be crucial. Water stores can be made and, and can be found anywhere. That's not a problem. Pipes and heat exchangers to handle hot water safely, they're pretty common as well. The solar collector would have metal plates in it, pipes possibly of silicone, possibly metal, possibly something else. Insulation, easy to get, you can even use straw. Uh, glazing, which could be glass or polycarbonate, and black paints, which just need to be high temperature tolerant. And a thermostatic blender valve, a thermostatic on-off valve, which only opens above a set temperature. What are the unique selling points of this? Well, it's appropriate manufacture. Everything's totally local, not in the West. That's the ambition. Only common parts are needed, new or reclaimed. Very low cost. That's a vital success criterion. If people can't afford to buy one bit, it's not going to happen. The replication's got to be viral. It's got to be safe, easy, rapid. And it's got to operate very easily with minimal skills. I think it may happen. I don't think there's a zero chance it can happen, but I don't think there's a 100% chance that it can viralise either. What I want to do is to drop those barriers to viralisation as best I can. So what are the drivers for the project? Saving lives at the top, doing things quickly but efficiently, and working below budget. Currently there's zero budget, so <laughs> if you can come up with something, please do. I'm just trying to put no more than a day a week into this project at present. What's the critical path analysis? Well, any project has things that could block it, and um, here's some suggestions. Funding would help. Getting a, some kind of legal status, you know, is it a charity, is it funded through a university or what? Getting more members involved, putting them on a mailing list, allocating the jobs to them, getting a working product sorted out, making sure that it's safe and failure-proof, um, making sure that you, uh, you know, say key anti-infection criteria in normal use and abnormal use. That's crucial. Um, if people you know, mess things up, you've got to make sure that the water is safe still. Then is it successfully appropriatised to the, the destinations? Can it be rolled out easily? Can it be rolled out in one continent? Can it be replicated in more than one continent? Finally, can you save at least 100 lives? Not just protect 100 people, but save 100 lives. That's an example of a critical path analysis of where little steps can reach towards a, a solution which could suggest that the technology could then deploy virally and very successfully. I hope it was useful. Do contact me. I'm Barry Johnston. Thank you for listening.